Hello. Um, I realized really belatedly that I didn't even do one of these last week. So um, I'm going to try to cover two weeks at once here. Um, and I'll still try to keep it to 15 minutes. So, um, okay. So I found a really good one. I'm excited today. So I was looking at, um, so we're on May 2nd. The last one I did was April 25th we're on May 2nd. What has happened in this issue? All the suspense in Lady Audley's secret is winding up to a pitch. So, uh, at the very end of this issue in May 2nd, we have Robert Audley and Lady Audley meeting each other and Robert Audley straight up telling her, like, I'm waiting for some uh, an answer to my missing persons claim. And when I get an answer to this letter, like, I'm going to know. Basically, without saying it, they're having sort of a showdown. They're like looking at each other. She knows that he suspects her. He knows that she knows that he suspects her. And it's kind of this like, subtle, like who's going to make the move first. At the same time, we know that Phoebe Marks is working for her mistress, but we know that Phoebe's husband, Luke, is sort of blackmailing Lady Audley. Um, there's this whole thing like teased about the brew house door that Phoebe keeps telling him to um, close, telling Luke to close and he won't do it. He says he wants more money from Lady Audley. What else? Um, oh, Phoebe gives Robert Audley some. Oh, Robert, in the initially in the issue, he's turned out of Lady uh, Audley Court um, because basically Lady Audley doesn't want him snooping around, and she convinces her husband Michael Audley to kick him out. And instead of just leaving, Robert goes to the inn where he, you know, doesn't really know right away that Phoebe and Luke are in league with Lady Audley. Um, Phoebe's giving Robert this tea and you're kind of like, oh my God, should he be drinking something she gives him? And guess what I found in the issue today? I'm so excited. This is so cool and such a perfect example of how the fiction in a magazine was tied with the articles they were publishing. So in one of their miscellany sections, things worth knowing. The first one is red herrings. And yes, Red herring since at least 1807, so 50 years before Lady Audley's Secret was published, red herrings meant what it means for us today, which is like a false lead in a mystery. And that's where we are. Things are like getting so, so tense in this story, and you don't know what's a red herring and not. You're not sure what's relevant. Okay, so red herrings. In an old pamphlet dated 1599, the author tells us that the discovery of red herrings was owing to accident. A fisherman, having hung some up in his cabin, went, what with his firing and smoking, his herrings, which were white when he hung them, became, hung them up, became red as a lobster. So this is literally just about the red herring as a fish. But remember, it for at least 50 years prior to the 1863, was being used as a term in mystery novels. So it's just so, or not mystery novels, since that was kind of a new genre, but as um, evidence that you sh could get on the wrong track with. It's almost like a tease of the editor to be like, watch out for red herrings. But no, we're just talking about the fish. But like everybody knows, it's so fun. Um... Let's see, strong memory. And if you look back, you'll see that when Phoebe is giving Robert Audley his tea and he's trying to see what Phoebe knows, he says that he thinks she would be so great on a witness box. And we know that witnesses are called on for their memory, right? So this is another thing coming up. Strong memory. A lady who heard the march at... Conningsburg, which was played at the coronation and composed expressly for the occasion by Meyerbeer, has published the same. Her memory must be wonderful, for she has been faithful to every note and accord. The composer natu naturally incensed has sought justice, but the the judge would not recognize the delinquency of the holy visa of the of the lady vis-a-vis -vis with the wonder of her extraordinary memory. This odd enthusiasm on the bench would not be likely to be met with in England. 
So they're talking actually about plagiarized music, but they are referring it to and this one. I'm noticing like the headlines are calling out key words and key themes of the issues. Let's see. We've got time for me to skim the rest of this issue and see what else they're covering in this section of Lady Audley's Secret in the rest of the magazine. Okay. Fiction, fiction, fiction. And remember, where things may not seem totally relevant, they may be related to the other two or three novels that they're serializing in this same magazine. Science. Uh, another thing about the railroad, short lines of railroads, a small locomotive has been constructed to run upon a railroad, the gauge of which is only 20 inches. So you've already been able to see this far in Lady Audley's Secret that Robert Audley's ability to sort of jet to and from London is really critical. And he's been asking railway station managers if they've seen George. Um, and soon it'll, it'll get sort of a like cat and mouse game through the railroads. So it's uh, fitting that they're often updating about railroads in the science section. There's an article about Canada. Hmm, Lady Audley's Secret. What is a bedroom? Sweeps and the first of May on morning. The word villain. Our word villain now become one of the most appropriate terms in the English language, formerly meant nothing but an inoffensive bondsman. And the word vassal, now almost synonymous with slaves, only signified a feudal tenant or grantee of land. Our detestation of this word vassal shows how much the system of the feudal times was hated in this country. Interesting. And of course, they're realizing that people would be thinking about villains as they read some of these novels. Strong memory, the late, the something about an aristocrat. What is a bedroom? Improvement in London cabs. Again, this hearkening to transportation. Um, it is now more than 200 years ago since hackney carriages made their first appearance in London. The general belief is that they were preceded by sedan chairs. Before that particular mode of conveyance was introduced, they had been used, they had been in use nine years. Okay, this is critical because. There's an entire two page article, which uh, uh, mostly one page, but with this very small print and three columns, that's actually quite long about the history of transportation in London, because the editors would have known that with all the emphasis and significance of railway travel in Lady Audley's Secret, and you'll see as we go on that certain parts of the plot just couldn't have happened if railway travel hadn't existed, that people will be thinking about that. They'll be thinking like, man, like all this could happen because of like people can travel so fast. And they're going to be thinking, my cat is running around being really loud, so sorry. Um, uh, they're going to be thinking about like, wow, think of all the innovations and how certain um, dilemmas, certain situations couldn't even have happened without this. And so they're going back even farther and talking about horse-drawn carriages, what came before them, how they were developed, and spending, there's usually only one or two full-page articles in the London Journal. Um, so for them to spend that much time on this demonstrates that they would have really been tuned into the fact that their readership would have been contemplating the wonders of transportation technology. Okay, so let's go on to the, and they're talking about May, the 1st of May, a lot. Let's go on to the next issue, which is May 9th. Um, again, this is because I should have done two last week. 
So let me just skim what is going on in Lady Audley's Secret. Even though I just read last week's, I never know exactly. I don't want to give anything away accidentally. Uh huh. Come on. Okay, so there's increasing encounters between Lady Audley and Robert that are somewhat obvious, but he's not 100% sure how they've worked out. And then he's going down. He still is like kind of not wanting to be responsible for all this, to have the whole burden of this on him. And so he's going down to George Talboys' father's house to talk to his father about it and try to try to get his father engaged so that he can be relieved of this burden. Uh, but this is after two chapters, a pretty intense conflict of Robert being aware that somebody had broken into or had tried to break into his home. Um, we have more involvement of trains. Um, okay. So let's see what we have here. I'm going to go back to the beginning of the issue now that we've oriented ourselves and it always starts with some fiction. Ooh, this is exactly, okay. I'm not giving anything away, but I will say that a major theme of this novel, if you hadn't caught on to it yet, here it is, is Robert coming out of a lazy life where he just basically lived on his inheritance. He was born into money. He never, it says he's a lawyer who's never worked a day in his life. So he went to college, never did anything with it. And this whole time, there is a question of like, who is he benefiting if he solves this mystery? Is he just causing more pain? But it's also that he wants to, he, he doesn't want to have to be responsible. Like life is easier if you don't take on burdens. Um, and so not only is he worried about the particular implications of this dilemma, but he's having to come into his own and take responsibility and take an active role in his own life and world. Whereas before he only lived for himself, he adopted, you know, these like kind of mangy dogs because he felt like it. He didn't really care about his cousin, Alicia. He just lived for himself and his own pleasure. And by the end of the novel, we see him being pulled out of that by these demands um, to solve the mystery of his friend's disappearance. But he's often very reluctant. And he's like, I was living this great life all focused on myself and now I'm doing all this hard work that I think might hurt people. Why am I doing it? It was so much easier when I just lived for myself. So look at this article I just found. Um, because he's really starting to talk about that. You'll see in the, the issue for May 9th, he says, um, is this going to be the first lawyer's brief I ever wrote? Like it's the first work I've ever done is trying to solve this mystery. The difference. There are pleasure-loving, selfish natures which shrink away from the first hint of pain or disagreeableness at what cost soever to those who suffer, even though the latter may have the strongest social or natural claims upon their confidence and sympathy. Alas, what would this world of pain and trial and suffering be were all thus determined to hedge themselves in from those on whom the burdens of life fall too heavily? We're friends only to be friendly while the eye can sparkle and the voice be musical with laughter. Were the suffering to be shunned on any or all of this flimsy, of the flimsy pretext with which the pleasure loving selfish nature, selfishness persuades itself that non interference is the best. This is a direct commentary on Robert Audley's character and his growth. Like, quote this in all your papers if you're in my classes. I'm telling you, this is perfect. Um, how beautiful in contrast with such sounds, the tender, sympathetic words of the true hearted. 
to whom every tear and pang is only an added reason for kind words and kind offices. Blessed are they who have even one such warm friend. For they, those who have many, life is yet full of blessing, though the sky be dark above them. Oh, that is a direct comment on the character of Audley and one of the major themes of the book as he grows in his character. We're kind of out of time and I don't want to keep you all too long, so I'm just going to skip around and make sure if there's any other gems like that bodily exercise and necessity this is sort of a more almost facetious relation to his laziness that's interesting there's a, a pretty long article about how you have to exercise <laughs> yeah and that exercising the body is really important for keeping the mind active and that the two are connected which we increasingly realize is true in modern uh, science and psychology um, but that's fascinating that they're also talking about his laziness there because it does talk about how he doesn't hunt, he doesn't shoot, he just sits around. Um, fascinating. Yeah, they're really talking all about his character. Think about the architecture, how threatening dark and night are. A forest at night. Darkness makes the brains giddy. Man needs light. Whoever plunges into the opposite of day, his heart is chilled. When the eye sees blackness, the mind sees trouble. And we have like going into sort of the, the climax of like mystery here in the novel, which we associate with darkness. Um, and it's now snowing in the book. So it's like a darker wintry time of year with less um, daylight hours. Yeah, fascinating stuff. They're really hitting it hard in this issue, the direct uh, references to what's going on in the book. Bird's sense of danger, the power of judging of actual danger and the face and easy boldness which results from it are by no means uncommon. Many birds seem to have a most correct notion of a gun's range and while scrupulously careful to keep beyond it, confine their care to this caution, though the most obvious resource would be to fly right away out of sight and hearing, which they do not choose to do. And they sometimes appear to make even an ostentatious use of their power, fairly putting their wit and cleverness and antagonism to that of man for the benefit of their fellows. This is actually interesting because Robert Audley is like, I could just leave this alone. I'm playing with fire here. And he has like an awareness when he comes into his apartment and then he confronts the blacksmith. But he like, instead of just dropping the matter, which he keeps considering doing, he pursues, but at a distance. Oh, it's fascinating. This issue, they're really like, it's almost like they're amping up the number of relevant articles as the tension amps up to keep their readers immersed in the mystery. It's really, really cool to read these. Well, I'm going to keep this kind of short. I don't want to keep you over time, so I won't go too much over time today, but this is really fun. Um, and stay tuned as we get farther into the climax and then into the denouement as we go on. Bye guys.